Hello and welcome everyone. Lovely to see you here today. Hi, my name is Morag and welcome to our Permaculture Education Institute Masterclass. I'm so delighted to have your company here today. I'm calling in from the unceded lands of the Gubby Gubby and I would like to pay my deep respects to elders past, present and emerging and I would love to invite you to drop into the chat, find the chat below, wherever it is on your device, open it up and um, let us know where you're calling in from and uh, the, the traditional custodians of the land on which you're seated. And if you can also just make sure too that you are muted for this session, that would be absolutely fantastic. And um, we will have a chance to uh, have questions as well as part of this. Uh, but in the meantime, if you wouldn't mind just keeping it muted, that would be wonderful. So the Permaculture Education Institute, let me just do a quick introduction of that because every time we run these masterclasses, um, this is actually the number, well, it's the 51st masterclass that we've run every month. Uh, well, most months of the year, we don't do it on, on Christmas and things like that, but most months of the year for 51 months, we've been running these sessions. And it's an absolutely fantastic way to explore Work. topics. I'm just going to um, pop in and help mute some people in just a minute. There we go. I think that's fine. Okay. So this is a fantastic way to explore themes that have arisen as part of our community. Often we respond to questions that people are asking or topics that we see coming up over and over. And this theme of storytelling is one that has just been such a, an ever-present topic. You know, I really think that great educators use stories to bring their teaching to life and to really make their class is memorable and fun and to, to be really sticky. You know, you understand and you take home the ideas when the story kind of touches your heart and there's something that's enchanting about it that really makes you think deeply or differently or feel differently about something that you've just heard or you've experienced in a class. And uh, also Charles Eisenstein, as I said in email, said this, uh, how do we change the world? We change the story. And a lot of what we try and do here in the Permaculture Education Institute is really to support the flourishing of amazing permaculture educators around the world. And we do this through a series of programs. We have a permaculture educators program. We have teachers programs. Um, we have permaculture share, share permaculture, which is about how we communicate permaculture into the world. And then there's these masterclasses. So I'd like at this point to welcome to our masterclass, Jenny Cargill Strong, who's currently based in Brisbane. And uh, she's gonna lead this session and we'll be in conversation throughout it and we'll give space to, uh, to respond to questions that unfold during this time. So just a little bit of a background about Jenny and I hope that you've um, checked out some of those links that we shared in, in the invitation to this event. So Jenny is a storyteller and a storyteller educator, an award-winning Australian storyteller who's been sharing uh, for three decades and teaching for at least two decades. Uh, and so Jenny's going to share with us some of the kinds of stories and why stories and how to craft stories and really how to enchant and transform our audiences and find ways to connect her craft of storytelling recording in progress. with our craft of sharing and teaching permaculture into the world and so it's a generative process and I'm so excited to have Jenny here as part of our exploration today so I think without anything more we can jump on in to this and so um, thank you so much Jenny for being here and um, it's lovely to have your company I think maybe just before we we sort of dive into the whole what is storytelling and how it weaves with permaculture how, what got you into storytelling to begin with? Where did that spark emerge for you? 
Well, um, I just want to answer a question with a question also because I want to hear again, maybe not now, but when you feel to. When we would do, I came along to the second um, networking event that you held, and you told this beautiful origin story of your how you came to permaculture. And so the reason um, I wanted to share some of my my different um, pathways to storytelling and to gardening was that to model that it's a really great thing for educators or anyone who's running a group to use to to tell their own origin story to model it and it doesn't have to be fancy and it doesn't have to be slick so I'm not I haven't practiced an origin story or I've got a polished one because I think the whole purpose of this session is how to demystify storytelling some people who are listening may be performers with those kind of skills but that's not what this is about this is about just using storytelling in, in a more ordinary way even though it can have an extraordinary effect so I loved hearing your origin story and if that comes up but I'll answer your question first um so I was born into a family where there were a lot of storytellers, fortunately for me. They didn't tell um, traditional stories, but I have a, a mother who, I had a mother, who was very animated and her whole face would light up and she'd use lots of gestures. And my, I was the baby of the family and my older sister and my older, older brother were quite expressive too. And although my father was your traditional Australian male, who, who wasn't expressive at all, um, he was a speaker. He was a natural speaker and quite funny. And he started lots of rostrum clubs. So I sort of grew up saturated in story without even realizing it. And um, I didn't know what I wanted to do in life. I did a BA and I drifted around, you know, because our generation benefited from free education. So you could do it just for fun, you know. So I did sociology and English literature. I didn't, maybe I wanted to be a teacher like my sister. I didn't really know until. One day I was standing up at Noosa and I fell into this poster. I saw this poster and it had a black and white graphic on a cheap coloured photocopy of a girl, a young woman performer with those stripy, stripy stockings, kind of, you know, like, stripy stockings and she was um she was looking through her legs from behind and she had a cat mask on and it was just a really French looking image and it and I and I stepped at, at looking at it and I just kind of fell into it and I didn't even know really what it was about it was just this image just kind of I'd never had that experience before in my life where there was something that just grabbed me and said this is for you come and do it you know and and it was this little course in the Gold Coast and I had lots of prejudices against the Gold Coast you know I was like oh the Gold Coast but it was wonderful and there I met the director of the Drum Action Centre who was um who was teaching all sorts of different kinds of she had all sorts of guest teachers and we did all sorts of traditional arts and storytelling was just one of those things um but the other thing that had um led me to think about that kind of training was hanging out with theater and education performers and theater and education performers that really attracted me because i i was very dramatic i love drama but the whole idea i'd done a little bit of um when i was doing my ba i did a little bit of theater and i didn't like the whole thing of a script and being an actor and pretending to be somebody else it was fun but it wasn't for me and also there was a kind of a bitchy culture there I'm just I'm quite sensitive I was like oh I can't, I can't cope with this and so I ran a mile but um and I could see there was no way of making a living out of it um and then I so so then that sort of alerted me that I wanted to do performance training but I didn't know what and so the drama action was central was a I had a psychodramatic basis so it already had a component which was oriented towards community building towards um, enhancing communication between people and people weren't there just to be performers only two of us actually became professional performers and one became the director some of them were doctors nurses a nun who just retired stopped being a nun um who basically just wanted some professional development and some juice in their lives and um so so that that was that was the beginning of of storytelling for me mm. yeah wow a poster on a wall <laughs> I love that you know and, and there's something so we might even talk about that in a little bit too about you know the visual stories and and how we can use those but you know perhaps we could begin it at well, carry on. That was the beginning. Carry on into what what for you can, constitutes like what what is story like, and mm. what kinds of stories are the ones that you find yourself drawn to telling that have that transformative capability. 
Mm, mm. So, so that's a different question to using storytelling than education. So we'll get to that later. But, um, but to be honest, my personal favourites are trickster stories. I love trickster stories, and I love um, stories of the feminine, mystical, magical stories. Um, and I had a little train of thread thought that was going somewhere, and it's just floated off. Um, so oh, it was just there, you know, that when that thought just got there. Um, ask me another question. Okay. So <laughs> I'll, I'll get it. <laughs> the stories then that, um, so, I mean, for me, I always think too of education as being, you know, something that is transformative. So the kinds of stories then, there are many different types of stories. Yes. I always say I that, that. Yeah, 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 go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So there's a big difference between a platform teller. So tonight I'm not going to tell any fancy stories with a dramatic arc. Um, I'm just going to tell, if I, if we get around to me telling a story, it'll be very short and very simple because I want to model that in the context of what we're talking about in just an hour. If anyone wants to see me tell a fancy proper story with a dramatic arc that's performative, then you can go to my website and you can listen to recordings and you can watch um, the YouTubes. But in fact... Uh, we are hardwired to receive information encoded in a story. We are hardwired to receive information encoded in a story. And it lifts our attention rate enormously, but it doesn't have to be a big performance story. So, you know, we, we, can, we can quite honestly say everyone is a storyteller in a sense. Everyone has an innate or, you know, you can cultivate an ability to be a storyteller, but not everyone can be a platform storyteller that performs people and tells an amazing story that everyone's hanging on their seats for. But we can all tell a story and we can all tell stories that are educative. Um, and an anecdote is just as useful. So um, Steve Denning wrote a book. Um, he was the an educator for the World Health Organization. And he used to go around and do these talks and have all these big charts and graphs and things and and you know people all bought their his graphs and he was always giving these lectures and you know people look like they really enjoyed it but what he realized over the years was people weren't remembering what he was saying because we just can't the data sort of goes in and out it, it doesn't stick what a story does is it gives a framework that we're naturally evolved to understand and to and it sticks to that and we remember that more but also we need to be emotionally engaged so you can use um, telling your origin story for one example or even just a little anecdote from your own gardening experience that will warm your students to you because you suddenly become a real human being. And the whole um, development of um, empathy and um, connection is a huge part now, research is showing. That's an incredibly important part duh, of learning. <laughs> Is that if we like the teacher and we warm to the teacher and we feel heard and we feel responded to, we're going to also be able to learn. Because if our if our defences are up and we're thinking, oh, I'm stressed, you know, I don't feel seen, I don't feel heard, I don't like this person, they're yelling at me, it's very hard to learn. But if you feel warm and you feel connected and you feel like you might have went home with them in your imagination because they told you a story about how they grew a tomato and how they cooked that tomato and, and what they do personally or what their you know uncle frank said then you suddenly feel welcomed into their into their person i have a little story to share then on that example because something that popped into my mind was i have this little pumpkin story and any of you who've been to my sessions before have probably heard me talk about the pumpkin story <laughs> but anyway this is how it goes so um, I grow a lot of pumpkins in my garden and, and I don't actually grow them necessarily. I don't grow them. They grow themselves. <laughs> Ever since I can remember in my garden, pumpkins have emerged on their own every year, sometimes several times a year. And I just discover them and I enjoy their, you know, their product. Now, when I was in Korea, I was teaching in Korea and in the middle of the table, they have all these beautiful um, vegetables and leaves and tofus and chilies and chili paste and all sorts of things. And, and in the middle with these big leaves, and I thought, oh gosh, they look so much like pumpkin leaves. And I found out, you know, what they were. And yes, indeed, they were actually pumpkin leaves. And I said, <laughs> I'd never thought before to eat a pumpkin leaf, these scratchy kind of big things that you didn't actually want to touch. And there they were grabbing these lightly steamed pumpkin leaves putting a bit of 
um, rice and chili and chili paste and you know chili kimchi and then rolling it up and then dipping it into more chili paste and eating it it's like oh my gosh all of a sudden in my garden I have so much food I always wait and look for the pumpkin but then when I look at this garden now full of all these pumpkins all of that is edible it's such a revelation and then I start to think I gosh, well, what else can I eat of all these things that are growing? It's not just the broccoli. It's all of the broccoli. It's not just, you know, the, the cauliflower. It's all of the cauliflower. And so my understanding about a garden just transformed. And then the other thing, I went over to someone's house one, step, one, one time, a friend of mine, and uh, she got this big pumpkin. And she just started whacking into it and tossing it in the pot. And I said, oh, what are, what are we having today? And she said, oh, pumpkin soup. And I went, What? my dad was the best pumpkin soup maker in my world and he I grew up with dad making pumpkin he would carefully take off all the edge it was a very slow process and scoop out all the seeds and I'd pop into the compost bin and he'd carry that down the back and there was never any skin on it never any seeds on it nothing and uh and it blew my mind I was thinking oh my gosh what soup with with seeds soup with and it's like of course that's where all the my you know those nutrients are in and the seeds have all the protein and she cooked it up and blended it up and it was a revelation and again it's this sense of like oh my gosh pumpkin we can eat it all and so I take this story to me when I'm out with the pumpkin under my arm teaching in a community garden somewhere and I start to talk about but if I sat there and I told you well you can eat all of the pumpkin and you can eat the leaves and the seeds and the flowers you probably would not remember that and so no. I try and wrap up all my plant stories in it, some history or culture or my own story about my revelations when it when it came to me. It's like, oh, gosh, I never thought about that before. And that's kind of how I've used story. I never thought of myself as a storyteller, though. And this is where it's interesting because I think how you describe story helps to unpack for me like and and almost give me permission in a way yeah. to find those little stories and anecdotes. And yeah, yeah, they're like yeah. coat hangers for your memory. And exactly. And I've heard you say several times because I've I've listened to you talk about how to use all the different parts. And I've taught other people. I'm like, oh, Maureen Gamble says you can eat the passion fruit leaves. Do you know that? And people are, like, oh, um, but it's much more powerful when you hear the story. And, and I was telling you about also how um, you had a little video where you said I just popped the whole tomato in the garden and I have never had success with tomatoes until I did that. I just put whole, whole um, tomatoes in the garden and I just had more and more and more tomatoes. I can make um, bolognese sauce all the time. It was absolutely revolutionary. I've got no idea. I went to Bunnings and got the exact kind that the man at the community garden told me faithfully was the best variety for Ballina, which I don't live in now, but um, it didn't work. You know, I got two, maybe two that didn't look very well. And then, and I had to fuss over them, you know, but these ones, they were just, they were, just pushing themselves out of the ground and, and I've also yeah I've heard you say that you wished you could tell stories more and and I was giving you some feedback um after the last networking session you already are that's right you already are telling stories and using them very powerfully and I also want to say you and I maybe we've both grown up for whatever reason we've both grown up in expressive families we've been given permission to be expressive we haven't been shut down you know some families are very quiet no one's role modeling being expressive or if you are you're made to be wrong so we have a natural advantage that we don't have to push against um but even so even though you could learn to be more expressive in your storytelling and that might help there are lots of really wonderful storytellers who are not very expressive who don't use who aren't expressive like you and me you know who don't use their whole face and their whole body and and the vocal variation and all that stuff you can actually also be a very powerful storyteller without all of that so basically I just want to let remind people and reassure people that there are as many different ways of telling a story as there are people and there's no right or wrong it's just whether it works or not if you can see that your listeners are listening and they're remembering right yeah yeah and I think that's for me as a permaculture educator the opportunity to keep trying it out like mm. I say yes to pretty much any opportunity to go and speak because it gets me in front of all different kinds of audiences. It could be an audience at a garden club. It could be an audience on, you know, like at a festival. And that, and it is, it is about building a relationship, isn't it? And you keep trying out different things. Some might not work. Sometimes you kind of wait for the reaction that you got at one and it doesn't happen. And then you, 
<laughs> then you keep trying something new and and you become like it, it is it is practice it's an it's not something that just kind of happens necessarily for me anyway so I wonder what you think about that of the, the art of practicing your oh, sorry the the practicing of the art of storytelling yeah, and it is really hard to practice storytelling on your own so totally like it's even even for me I've been telling stories for 30 years I need an audience to practice a new story on and most storytellers are the same it, it, there's a certain amount you can do on your own but it is if it's a really involved story but if you're just using anecdotes for teaching um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give yourself too hard a time about it being really amazing, but it will improve. And the thing is about, um, there's two things. Uh, what, one I just want to cover is if you see, rather than our culture teaches us a lot through our education system to, to feel judged and feel marked, because we often, when we, um, when we speak uh, at school, you know, we get marked and there's sort of a red mark or a, or a black tick you know and 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 peers can be unkind and so we learn to feel a bit cautious about it and we internalize the critic but in fact most people and especially in a permaculture class would be quite a warm receptive audience wouldn't they they'd be quite a willing audience and um and so so you can actually shift the if you just shift the way that you think about it and think of yourself as a conduit for a story so rather than thinking it's me having to tell you a story it's like opening up if you can just be a little bit cosmic just a little bit um open to what are the story wins that want to blow at the moment what what are this what are the stories what's the story that wants to come through me right now in this moment and i mean i've had an incredible experience of of having a story say tell me tell me i was at the bentley blockade and um, this story wanted to be told over and over. It just kept saying, tell me. And I'm thinking, I don't see the relevance. I'm sorry, but no, I can't tell you. But no other story would come to my mind until the very last day. This is like a blockade that you might be familiar with of the, um, that some malicious might not know about to prevent um, fracking. And um, it was an amazing three-month campaign. At the very end, on the day that we found out that we'd won and, the, and the everyone was gone, there was a beautiful circle made by a friend around the, the spot where the ground would have been penetrated by the drill. And we had a beautiful closing ceremony and no one wanted to leave because we just had this amazing time for three months. And it was there when I was standing in that circle that I suddenly realised that's why that story wanted to be told. Oh, it's the perfect story for right now. So sometimes a story will say, pick me, pick me, and you don't always understand logically why, but sometimes if you trust it and give it a go, you might suddenly find there's someone in the in the group of listeners that go, oh, right, there's some, something about that story that illustrates something that may not always be logical, like might not always be a gardening story. It might be a story that illustrates a concept that you're trying to explain in a different setting. Mm. So I'm wondering, as you're saying that, these stories that ask you to be told, do you write these stories? Are they stories that you've received as, from other storytellers? What's your process of, uh, sorry, there's lots of questions all in one. Sorry, I'll come back to one <laughs> question. How do you construct a, a story then? Like if this is a story that you're going to share for a certain thing, how do you sit back and start to to plan what that is? Because I know as a storyteller who's been doing it for 30 years, you must have so many stories you can just, you know, draw on. But if you're just beginning, how do you start to cultivate or nurture that suite of stories to be able to um, tap into in that way? Uh, well, the stories that are already made? Or... Probably do what I did at the beginning, and that is look for, look for stories that help you. So... I'm um, trying to think of stories for particularly for permaculture. I can't think of a lot of resources of collected stories that um, that may particularly suit. But if I keep thinking, um, you know, there are certain lots of collection of folk tales, like folk tales about trees that can sometimes be used if you're teaching about um, growing trees and getting the soil prepared well. You might want to tell a story um, about that sort of thing. So it depends whether you want to use a story that is a folk tale that illustrates something or connects people emotionally to what they're learning or whether you want to use something that is just anecdotal. So, for instance, um, the, I sent a link to you, the, the person who mentored me in environmental storytelling when I first got going, Dr. Fran Stellings from America. She has a son who's a permaculture designer and he wrote a story about the microbes to explain 
um, something about oxygen and how oxygen came to be the dominant um, air, you know, or, or what do you call it, um, gas in, in the planet. And um, so it, I, you have to immerse yourself in some stories for a while to get a sense of how the structures work. So I would say, I mean, one place to begin is at my website. I've got a lot of resources there. So there's lists of stories and there's um, YouTubes and there's playlists of other storytellers telling stories. And so as you listen to more stories in your spare time or going for a walk and you're listening to, a, there's a lot of stories online, um, you get a sense of the structure and you might even have a go at uh, probably the first starting point would be to tell your own gardening stories as you did the other day, um, which I don't know if you want to tell it now, but I can't remember which story it was. <laughs> Hey, you came to permaculture. So you, you, you talked about how you went overseas to Ladakh. Mm -hmm. And then when you came back, you'd finished, you couldn't do your master's and you felt like you're being garroted. Mm -hmm. And then you started the community farm mm -hmm. and how, how all of that felt. And it was very visceral telling. It was very emotional telling. Um, and so there's those stories and then there's just the practical stories and like when I did my very first gardening course at the Byron College there was um, a teacher there who'd lived in Italy for a long time and she was saying how you know once upon a time people would just sit over the back fence and talk about what they were doing in the garden or whatever and they had um, little things that they would refer to like oh it's time to plant the tomatoes because it's since such and such as day so Sometimes it's just a tag that you sort of you're sticking a fact to that helps people remember. I don't know if that helps. But. How do you how do you shift from having a script to mm. having a you know when someone gets stuck on a script and you go oh here's that story again <laughs> and it's like yeah. oh. and you know yeah. as to keep it fresh like I think that's what I'm asking like how do you keep a story fresh and alive and relevant to the people rather than just you know collating a whole set of you know yeah and the goats and just throwing it you know yeah What's and so I, I apologize to all the people writing in the chat we're not quite able to keep up with it all and there's some great things to us to read afterwards and, and we might get a chance to answer some of them at the end but um I just wanted to show you a graphic which might help so um in answer to your question I have told some stories word for word because I'm a platform teller and I get paid to do it so sometimes I have done that but I've generally found it's like trying to wear someone else's coat. Mm. It doesn't quite fit and it's not quite me. I'm actually being an actor when I do that. So really the essence of experience storytelling and you have to be kind to yourself and start somewhere. Um, if you have to tell a story word for word, just like somebody else did, you know, that's fine. Mm. Just start there. And um, you can start by, you know, you read it out first and then you let it and then you put it down. You go, oh, hang on a minute. What happened next? And then you pick it up and then you do that sort of process and you tell it to yourself in the car. But I'm just going to do a graphic which was taught to me by Ashley Ramsden, who's a great um, English storyteller who came over to um, Australia a while ago. And it's both a way of, oh, hang on, I've done it. Put it in another piece of paper. It's both a way of remembering a story as well as a way of thinking about how to tell it without telling every single word. So you can learn the start word for word. So you've got a solid landing, right? Oh, I use the um, I use the shaggy thing. There we go. So you can so you learn word for word the starting sentence, right? And then one of the middle crucial sentences where they're like really important reveal this. And then the very last concluding sentence. So you've got a safe start, a solid middle and a solid landing. If it's a longer story and you've got some more time, you can just learn. I mean, in a teaching story, you don't really need it word for word necessarily, but um, it's more to get the order. Maybe in your situation, it's more to get the order. So if you're, if, you know, as a performance storyteller, if I'm using archaic language, that can be quite important to the essence of the story because I want to evoke that culture or that time. But I imagine you just need to get a sense of um, what the order is. So here you put, um, a, then you might remember, memorise one bit there and one bit there. And maybe you put those lines on the toilet 
wall and every time you go to the toilet you have a little look or whatever um, helps you and then um uh, yeah. my drawing isn't the best sometimes so this is a very messy but um the idea is then you've got a story parachute for a safe landing so that you don't need all of it. You just need the crucial bits. If you don't have much time, just in the beginning and the end and maybe a bit of the middle. And so depending on how perfectly it needs to be, like if you're presenting as a keynote speaker at a conference, you might want it to be really, um, really polished. But if it's just a class and it's just a rough story to illustrate a point, you might just want to have a sense of the sequence. Another way... Um, to learn that, where did I put my other illustrations, is to do a story map. So um, this is a story map for the mulberry tree, a story that I wrote about my childhood story tree, which is recorded on an album. And it shows you, um, this is the beginning of the story and it goes around like that. So obviously I'm not an artist, but I have done that just as a memory graphic. It's only meant to trigger my memory and in fact it doesn't even need to be that good looking as long as I, I mean that's fabulous clearly clearly um but it doesn't need to be even um you can just do it so roughly that only you understand what it is but just as long sometimes those kind of processes especially if you're a visual thinker can help rather than writing it so it depends I also write my stories out but there is a huge huge difference between a written story and a told story and so when I write them down in order to remember it, in order to read back, I then have to read it aloud. And then I will have to actually go back and forth between them because it's very easy. If you just keep writing and writing it, it'll become a written story and it's not as easy to tell. So, so a, a, an oral story has a quick beginning, only a few characters and um, a definite resolve. It's got, and it's action based and I don't mean like you know violent action but just it's not a lot of flowery description because when you're listening to an oral story your brain is working really really hard to you're you're watching the speaker and you know how most of our brain is not actually focused on the words it most of our brain is thinking about the non-verbals and interpreting that person you're probably reading their aura I don't know what you're doing sniffing them I don't know um, but you know there's a lot going on <laughs> apart from actually the words so the words are just a part of it so that means you you want to go into this entrainment where you're listening so you can't actually cope with these long flowery descriptions which you can cope with when you're reading a novel mm. or watching a film yes. so the quick easy um quick to the action anything that's descriptive is is a part of the action you're describing it through the action you're getting a sense of the characters through the action but all of that is maybe even more than you maybe need mm -hmm. in the context of teaching a class and illustrating something about gardening I really like the way that you just going back to your parachute before and I was imagining actually the tables in front of me when I'm teaching a class back at you know some of those community education and what I would do and I'd take a whole I'd fill up my car with with plants and samples, for example, and I yeah. would lay them out on the table, a little bit like your parachute hooks, and I would start at one end and I'd work my way along and each plant had a story that was attached to it. And the start point would be focusing on um, sort of Indigenous plants and then I would move along and, and each plant would, would kind of weave into the next plant. And the story that unfolded through that um, went into sort of global pictures and into personal and there was you know stories of things that were happening you know in the journeys that I went overseas and so this story this class about permaculture gardening was this story so what I find challenging is I've often done all of this as a as oral storytelling and I have not been able to actually write any of this down on paper so mm -hmm. how do you transform an oral story into a written story and hold its essence. Oh, that's easy. You record, <laughs> on your phone, you record it on your phone or on your laptop and then you write down what you said. Oh, well, that's just too easy. <laughs> <laughs> there is a question. Yeah, you know, that's, yeah. 
thank you. <laughs> that's what I do. Yeah, no, yeah. But sometimes no, that's it's because it, it's maybe partly because you don't think of yourself as a storyteller that you haven't, like, you, you can solve almost anything, but there might be a little mental block going, I don't know how to do this, but actually you do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, it's easy to just do that. Okay. There is a question in that this, um, Janice has said, can you give an example of a story, please? I wonder whether maybe there might yes. be um, something we can bring in now as a story because we're talking about the stories, but I wonder whether there's yes. a story we can share that gives more of a flow of what we're exploring. Um, I but what story is called? I think uh, Hummingbird. I'm not quite sure why, but at the moment, Hummingbird and Elephant wants to be told. This is an Indian, as far as I'm aware, um, folktale fable. And um, Elephant was walking through the forest and came across Hummingbird lying on her back with her little legs pushed up towards the sky. And Elephant nearly stepped on Hummingbird and went, Hummingbird? and sipping on the nectar of flowers and hummingbird said elephant her her legs stretched up elephant i have heard that the sky is falling and i'm here to catch it well so you can imagine elephant laughed oh hummingbird don't be ridiculous firstly the sky is not going to fall and secondly if it did what would your little legs have to do you know help with anything and hummingbird took a deep breath she pushed her, her feet even higher towards the sky and she said elephant I am doing what I can do when will you join me and do what you can do so it's not a gardening story so much as if we're feeling overwhelmed and we don't know where to start it's like just do what you can do even though it might feel like a tiny little drop in the ocean if you just start you know it it it's it's doing what you need to do and maybe the elephants will join you it often happens that they do mm, thank you for sharing that i hope that helped janice <laughs> you know it's short short stories and then there's the long lilting stories and then there's the anecdotes what other kinds of how would you describe other kinds of stories into this so what you've origin story you've mentioned anecdotes um what other kinds hmm um, well, uh, let's do a screen share and I'll show you if I can find it. Yes, I can. Is that working? Yes, beautifully. So I just need to make it big enough for me to see. Um, it's not. Okay, so I just need to. Whoops. No, something's in the way. It's bleh. Okay. And then the chat, I just need to make the chat box go away, clutch and close it. Okay. Yeah, everything gets hidden behind all yeah. these things, don't they? Yeah. So um anyway, that'll probably do. It doesn't want to move over. I'm not sure. We're why. not seeing anything but your desktop at the moment. Oh, okay. I With the, all the files on it. Now, I've just opened the story categories. I'm not sure why that is. Well, it doesn't matter too much if, if you can't see it, but um not quite sure new share maybe there here we go is that better? Go. lovely perfect there. okay so um this is uh categories that i developed which i'm happy for other people to throw in other ideas and of course the thing about stories like many things is that uh it's a complex it's a complex myceliated overlapping community and most stories have multiple purposes and meanings and that's the rich thing about metaphors is that a story with a metaphor which you may not always use in the context of a permaculture teaching you, you know sometimes you might use those sweet stories and sometimes you might just need quite a practical story but um, you can look at the stories that inspire individual action stories that build community and show how we all need each other so there's lots of folk tales about that. And then there's the stories that um, we can fit, have a sense of interbeing and interconnectedness that illustrate that. So there are lots of traditional stories. And then it's just about getting, getting permission because often those traditional stories are from Indigenous custodians. So it's just being about a bit sensitive about that. But stories, even, um, you know, for me, having British ancestry, the, if you go far enough back, there are stories about interbeing in the sense that, 
you see humans who become animals and vice versa. So the ancient Celtic stories of Taliesin and the chase where um, there's a ma two magical shapeshifters chasing each other and they they turn into all different animals, a salmon and then it's, you know, all different, a bird and, and things. And then um, there's uh, this, this in, in from Scotland and Ireland and Scandinavian countries, there's the stories of the Selkie seals who go from being... Um, human to being seals so there's um depending on what it is you want to illustrate that that's how i think of um categories of stories that are for social change or for helping people shift um conceptually because we live in a in a culture that's we're swamped with individual messages so i think the most important ones in our situation is community and interbeing but you can see i've got the little overlap there in the Venn diagram to show, um, you know, that, that, that the sweet spot can, can be where they all intersect. Um, now, I'm not sure if I um, sent... Uh, this graphic, I'll go to the next one on, the, on this little... Oh, no, I'm not sharing screen anymore, hang on. Um, there's another, I just know that while we're in graphics, I just want to show you new share. Hmm, that's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Here's a little, oh, that's very little. <laughs> Why is it looking so little? Let's make it bigger. Okay. No, that's still very small. Okay, that's not going to work. Um, maybe stop, maybe stop sharing. Yep. Double click on your image and then share that or something share screen yeah i did it's too small Never mind. oh okay yeah uh for we'll share never mind it doesn't matter um well it does matter it would have been nice to share but um i don't know if you can share the one i sent of um mcleod let's see if this one will go bigger this one might be better Hang on. there so this this these ideas are more like the deep dive we're going out of just teaching permaculture now and thinking about the bigger um, sorry, Jenny, course. we're still only seeing your desktop. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Can you see it now? Yeah. Lovely. Awesome. That's the delightful thing about Zoom, isn't it? You never quite know what, what's showing, whether you've got spinach in your teeth or what <laughs> <laughs> you're showing. So the, the, now with all the concepts of fair share, um, people care and um, earth care, these things are relevant. So I'm skipping a little bit away from the question that you've asked me, but just to give some typologies in terms of types of stories, I wanted to give you a sense of the way that this, um, this is a bit theoretical, but it's showing how myth or story is a part of social change. So it might be easier to, to grasp this one here. And you can see there's four different elements of our culture. So if you want to change something, there's four essential things. This is the way that this um, person has um, has thought about it. And um, you can find these online. His name has just gone out of my head. I think it's um, look something. Kenneth, Kenneth McLeod, that's right. Kenneth McLeod from um, an Australian university. So you can see that we're going to change the technology, the ways of doing. We need to change our ways of thinking, the learning and knowing. We need to change our ways of thinking, existential earth consciousness, and we need to uh, shift to the domain of story, imagination, and creative practice. So um, what I like about this one is that it gives story a quarter <laughs> of the weight of social change that you know, our culture, if you think about it, is a weave, a tapestry of stories. Economy is a story. Law is a story. Um, all the way that we run our culture is based on all sorts of assumptions, which are, in a sense, stories. So um, shift, the, shift the stories, help people get a different grasp on the stories behind um, our thinking, and we can help shift the culture hopefully so so that's where i think permaculture is telling a new story permaculture is there creating a new myth a new way of thinking about things with earth care people care fair share that's another value system isn't it 
which overlaps over here as well. And, and it also covers all these different things. So I do love that one. Mm, um, that's great. There was a question, um, that, can we share these diagrams after? So would you be able to share totally. the links to me and yeah. I can send them out with the recording? Yeah, great. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's really powerful. And I really love the way that um, Kenneth is, has articulated the story the myth as being such an important part. And I mean, I think this is kind of, what this session is trying to get at the at the core of today is how important story is in permaculture education how important it is to be able to communicate the the depth of connection that we feel and the and and actually uh, finding new ways to articulate an ecological language a language that's not based in the mechanistic way of of sharing out stories but ways of you know you know, how we talking about myceliating and we're tending to this and, you know, the language that we use and the anecdotes that we bring into that and the metaphors that we use, different metaphors. And I think that's really important. I wonder whether you could talk a bit about metaphor because it's something that I sometimes find myself getting stuck on, you know, as like, what is it? What actually is a metaphor? Like, you know, I haven't been, I've been to English class for a long time. How can I use metaphor more as a in a way of, of storytelling? What can you kind of unpack that a little bit for us? Mm, mm. So, well, for instance, I'm working at the moment on a retelling of the Selkie, a Selkie story. There are lots of different Selkie stories, as I just mentioned about the, you know, the belief in. I was reading the fascinating history of it, but the belief of humans who became Selkies. And there were different reasons, beliefs about how that how that happened. But um, I was at the Australian Fairy Tale Conference last year, and we were discussing silkies. And the 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 woman Jo Henwood, who who began the Australian Fairy Tale Society, she is a museum interpreter and, and historian, and she was giving a lecture on how the silkie stories are actually the most retold in Australian history which surprised me because I hadn't heard many Australian versions yet so I've been starting to research them and I want to write an Australian version and what we were thinking about when I first came across the story of the Selkie seal it was by a wonderful Irish storyteller called Liz Weir and I was talking to other storytellers and we thought about it as this thing of because I need to tell you briefly a little bit about the story just so you understand the metaphor so a um um the, the most told version, there are also versions of a male selkie marrying a, a human, but mostly it's a man is walking along the beach, he's single, and he sees these three beautiful women dancing naked under the moonlight. And he knows from the stories that his grandmother has told him that these are selkies and that if he grabs their skin, you know, the one that he steals will have to marry him. And so he does this and the girl or the woman, you know, goes pleading, pleading, please give me back my skin. And usually in the story, she eventually relents and decides she likes him and she stays and marries him. Um, and then they have children, but he looks after the skin and the skin gets dry and um, it, sometimes it gets dry sometimes it doesn't but generally it gets dry and she is drying out she is she is mourning and she's a shadow of her former self until one day her child finds where the father has hidden the skin and takes it back to the mother and the mother says you know grabs her children and says oh thank you my darling you've given it back to me thank you thank you and I love you so much and I will be I'll be with you all your life but not in the form you see me now and she rushes down to the beach throws on the skin and becomes a seal and then visits them and brings them lots of fish and all sorts of things. So, so there's many ways of retelling that that um, can step outside of that patriarchal view. But what we were talking about was that the whole concept of the silky can be seen as the story of a middle-aged woman or a you know a woman who's, whose children have grown up and left home. She's done all the serving. She's feeling a bit dried out, you know, like she's served everyone. And now what about me? Especially like my mother's generation where that's all you did. You only, in fact, you had to leave your job as soon as you got pregnant. So um, you can feel really, well, men probably felt that in a different way, you know, feel really used up. And so the Selkie going back to the sea is a symbol for the woman when she rediscovers her soul life. But in this conversation we were having, um, Joe was saying, 
No, she didn't say it. We came, it came in the discussion. We were talking about how it can represent almost anyone who feels disconnected from themselves or their country or their culture. And then we thought it's just like a refugee or an immigrant or a, an Indigenous person, an Aboriginal person who is taken out of country, who is unable to speak language, whose children will be stolen if they show who they really are. Like that was a threat hanging over the seal wife that if anyone knew that her children were half seal, that they would be maybe taken from her or shunned or punished. Um, so that um, that is my favourite metaphor living at the front of my brain right now, a <laughs> long, long answer. But you can see how that metaphor can exist in many ways. And in fact, you can tell a story for a long time and not realise, oh, that's what that story is really about. For instance, I used to tell the story of the blue coat, which is on my website. And you can see, you can hear a recording and you can see a video of it. And I used to think of it as a story about recycling because it's this lovely story about a coat that gets cut down and trimmed down and trimmed down until it's really, really small. So it's a great story of, you know, family, familial love and just reusing things. And then when I got to tell it to a bunch of refugee teenagers in Brisbane, it dawned on me, it was the story of loss because this child, you know, each time the coat gets worn out, the grandfather cuts it and trims it back. And then eventually the only thing that's left is a button and the button can't be used, it just can't be recycled anymore or it disappears and so it's a beautiful symbol of loss because in the end, the child connects to the blue coat by grandfather weaving a story about it. And so they tell the story through the family. And that is what we do in culture. If we can't be on country, if we can't be in our home place or we can't be connected to our loved one, we can tell a story about them. We can hold them in our heart and keep them alive with a story. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That gave such a rich multiple dimensions to the question that I that I posed so thank you for that and as you were speaking um another question emerged and and in relation to permaculture education I suppose and that would be something around this notion of story of place and mm. how you can co-create stories possibly and I wonder whether mm. there's anything that you could share about how a community can co-create a story particularly if we're we don't have the old stories you know we're mm. trying to find our place again or find a place for the first time with a new group of people and whether there's some way that you know I'm thinking of that you know in terms of like the story say of North East Street City Farm and and for me like there's there's my story of North East Street City Farm and there's other people's stories of North East you know the origin of that where it came from and but you know the if there's multiple stories, do you try and weave those multiple stories together? Is there a core story, or is it okay for it all just to sit in, in the you know, in each of the individuals sharing that? Sorry, there were so many questions. Only one. Gosh, <laughs> <laughs> that's because you're so curious. Um, well, um, I think that you just have to do it. Like you just have to. I mean, what I did is I. I I went to New Zealand and I saw these young Māori children singing the song of their mountain and the song of their river and they, you know, they did it with such mana that I thought, wow, what kind of a world would we live in if everyone knew the song of their river and the song of the story of their mountain and so forth and their place where they were, maybe they would take better care of it. And so when I went home, I started an event which I ran for two years in Malambimbi. I'd had actually another event for a year before that in Brunswick but in Mullumbimby I had this fantastic event which was so supported by the community where I held um it was storytelling and I had it was all true stories and it was all local stories so I got I curated it and I because I knew almost everyone in the community after being there a long time I would invite people on a theme so one theme might be environment or another week the theme might be refugees or another week the theme might be sexuality or another you know so forth so um we had people speak and I I was very lucky that I had people who naturally got what stories are because not always not all people actually do I've lived in other places where they it's not quite so simple but I had all these people volunteer local stories and my idea was that then people get to know each other and then they can walk down the street and go, oh, I heard your story. I heard your story about the community garden or I heard your story about um, whatever it was about. And it did catalyze incredible connections. So I think 
Um, I was actually really disappointed that I didn't get to go to Northy Street. They had a little event where they were, um, it wasn't storytelling oriented so much as um, just an event for people to get together in warm up for the Winter Solstice Festival. And I was going to tell a story, but then something called me away and I couldn't go. So I think those kind of little community events or I'm involved with women's space are putting on little story weaving events. So you actually put on an event and you cultivate you have to cultivate a culture of storytelling, a culture of listening, which the mainstream Australian culture doesn't really have. We, you know, and the overculture is not all about listening, is it? All of our attention span is reducing. So I think you actually have to nurture, uh, create a space and a place and a way and a culture. And that can take time. Sharing food is great. And then really encouraging and supporting your storytellers. But you also have to guide them because if you let it be too loose, and you have too many long, boring stories, then that will deflate the whole thing. So you have to manage it a bit, I think. But Yeah, I really like that too. And I think some there's something about this as well that sometimes we feel like, oh, I couldn't possibly tell my story because that's not actually the story. Yeah. I think that's maybe where what I was wondering in this too, that actually creating space where we can each tell the story of how, how it has landed in us gives that possibility of the multiple dimensions I am just realizing that the time has getting away from us and I wanted to invite anyone who actually wanted to ask Jenny a question or drop into this space to bring forth another dimension of storytelling that you'd like to presence here um, and I just it, wanted to quickly add in and on I'm, I'm running an online story circle which you can find on Eventbrite which will answer hopefully online some of the question that you're asking. And then ultimately I want to run an event in, in Brisbane as well. Right. Oh, fantastic. So anything like that, Jenny, um, if, if I get those and then I can share them out with everyone um, in the email that will be following up with the recording of this session. So you can follow up as well. So if anyone, we've got this little function down the bottom here where you can either raise your hand like this, um, and it will pop you up to the front and we can see you because it's with so, so many people in the room, it's it's hard to, to find you. But if you'd like to ask a question or bring in something else, another dimension. Uh, lots of questions about community storytelling, lots of really interesting references to Hagitude and all sorts of things, yeah. yeah. Great. Um, so if we encourage people to storytelling events, should we give them a template to follow or let them speak freely? I think it maybe depends, and I'm just you kind of have to feel your way with your community. When I ran my storytelling event in Mullumbimby, I had a very story literate community. There was a lot of artists, a lot of activists, a lot of people kind of used to drama and they kind of got it. So I did, I did talk to them each about what it meant to tell a story, not give a lecture. Because some people assume you mean a lecture because that's all they know. They've never seen a story really told before. And so once you get the event going and then you've established the template by just modeling it, then people have an easier time with it. So I wouldn't say to give a template. Um, there are a lot of, um, yeah, I would just sort of give some, give some guidelines. And I was quite tight about the time. When I started, people only had 10 minutes, which is not very long. And most people went over. But I just didn't want to have a, like a 10-minute story that's a little bit shaggy. It's not as bad as a 20-minute story that's shaggy. But in the end, I found that my community, I could trust them, that they, were, they really had it. And so I actually, it was less trouble for me to have 20 minutes. And it was better because most stories... Um, that were really from the heart and soulful took pretty much that that long anyway so it's kind of feel it as you go but I'm happy to answer your questions if you email me yeah thank you there's a question from Fiona about her background is in journalism and what role do you see for storytelling in journalism not news writing I'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> that's sort of outside my level of expertise I haven't really I, so not news writing but journalism well I don't know I mean I guess the things that I relate to most have a good story in them, but I don't feel quite expert enough in that field to give you much of an answer there. Sorry, Fiona. Uh, yeah. I'll think about yeah, it. It's I'm actually Russ. 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 Hi, Russ. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's. Oh, Ross. Oh, sorry. How do you manage community storytelling? That's Olivia. I think maybe perhaps we've talked about that a little bit. I wonder if there's anything else that you wanted to add community storytelling I think you, you you probably you know it, it can be good depending on your community to have some storytelling workshops but I didn't actually need that in Mullumbimby because the storytelling was so strong when I then moved to Ballina 
I found a whole different situation. I felt, I found people who looked at me blankly when I asked them to tell a story, they're like, what's that? And then also I couldn't, like just a lot of no's. Whereas in mom, I, I was better known though. I, I knew who to ask already because I knew. So if you're very well networked in your community, um, then I think that that would be um, easier. Yeah. And I really do like what you're saying about the, the modeling of it. So, you know, the fact that you've got some stories that you can share, you know, online or if there's, you know, you know, video, like um, YouTube clips of you sharing a story and you can demonstrate what it is, you model the kind, what is the story? And I think that's, I think it does help. People aren't naturally, you know, relate to being a storyteller. They might actually hear it and go, oh, actually, I think I do have a story to tell. Exactly, or, exactly. Yeah. Because people just, I mean, look, even before I went to Drama Action, I had the same response, like, what's that? Uh, even though you kind of know, but you kind of don't know. So um, the other thing is there are a lot of story circles online. So you can, you can if you Google story circles or story storytelling online, you will find lots and lots of concerts, of story circles where you can have a go. So if you want to come to me, because you feel warm to me, you can come to mine. But, you know, if I'm not in the same time zone or something as you, then there is a lot online. So I'll, I'll give you a couple of little heads up, but basically Google will be your friend there. Yeah, great. And what about if you wanted, just as a final question, um, what if you wanted to start up your own story circle and you don't really necessarily feel you're a storyteller yet? You know, if you're just starting out and you're in a community group and you think, oh, I really love this approach, like how would you encourage people to get started in that? Well, maybe then you sort of, you, you just acknowledge that you're all finding your way together. And um I also, I just was distracted by Liz. I had a great question also. Carefully crafted questions can be used to support storytelling to a purpose. Exactly. And that's what I did. When I had someone I really wanted to interview because I had something fascinating and they said, well, I can't tell a story or they were kind of freaked out. Even though they were used to public speaking, they'd given keynote speakers because I did tend to hen hunt people I knew would be confident speakers. And there were a lot of them in my community. They would still sometimes be stuck about telling a story. And so I would stand side by side with them. In fact, there was a woman I know who is such an extrovert, but because the theme was very confronting for her, it was sexuality. And she was telling a very personal story. I stood on stage next to her and she never really needed me to say much I just stood there and I just touched her shoulder for a while mm. and then she was good to go. Mm. So it's just sort of feeling into that. But in answer to your question, Morag, I'm not sure because I've never run a storytelling event when I don't know much about <laughs> <a> story. <laughs> I just I, wondered whether you'd had experience of, you know, like you'd seen groups emerge. I'm just imagining like as a as people who are part of permaculture local groups or something think, yes, this is a great idea. This is a way that we could possibly unlock a, a way to sort of step out from the abouting into this this cultural shift, the possibility for transformation. And even well, in a even well, in a in a permaculture course, for example, if you think, okay, part of the learning that I'm going to share would be an opening of a, a story circle within the course to share about something. Hmm. Yeah, and it might be easier than you think. I, I I actually crafted a visualization when I left drama school, right? I'd done two years drama training. I had been directed by Neil Cameron, who used to do the fire event for Woodford Folk Festival, who's like a genius and myth, like world recognized. I had had so much support to be a performer. I'd been told I was great and all of that. And still, and I had mentors who were storytellers. I didn't feel I had permission. I thought who am I to be a storyteller? I don't come from a long lineage of storytellers. I haven't had some ancient granny knock top me on the shoulder and say, you, you've you got to tell stories, dear. So even I, with, with like theatrical skills and all of this sort of permission, in a sense, I'd been taken under the wing by other storytellers. I still had this sort of imposter syndrome thing. So I made up a visualisation for myself, which I now use in workshops, which is, you know, which anyone can do, which is basically to install your own inner permission by visualizing that that happens so mm -hmm. I didn't I had an amazing great grandmother I never met so I just visualized someone like her coming and saying I see the love of storytelling in you and I'm giving you my storytelling light and if you feel like you're not good enough for it well just remember that elder wasn't when they started either they were probably fumbling and mumbly and you know not sure and then they take baby steps and then slowly you give to yourself permission and you keep going and you will eventually get better. I think the, the thing that really gets in our way is we expect ourselves to be brilliant from the start. 
Mm. So allow yourself, I did this writing course where they said, allow yourself to be bad. Allow yourself to write the worst writing in Australia, the worst writing in the in the country, in the sorry, the worst writing in the in the planet and the worst writing in the cosmos. Just let it be bad. And that sort of takes away that horrible inner critic psychobabble. Yeah, thank you. And I, you know, I there's Liz is just saying too here that. You know, draw on this concept of, of storytelling is another part of your repertoire when you're teaching. And, and I really think that that's what I was hoping that we would get to as part of this session is this sense that it's possible and that mm -hmm. we don't have to have fully crafted stories, that it can be a sharing of, you know, like you're saying, an anecdote. You could begin with your origin story. You could invite people to share their origin stories. And, you know, there's other ways that we can tap into this and, and just keeping on showing up and, and maybe you know, joining a circle that's existing already that's hosted by someone who is a storyteller. And then, you know, having the courage to step up and inviting people to join and, and play in this space of being storytellers and see, I, see what happens. I actually forgot I do have an answer to your question when you said, <laughs> how do you do it when you don't really win it? Well, of course, I just ran a workshop in Nimbin for a woman who loved personal storytelling, like slam type, uh, moth type storytelling. And she really wanted it to happen in Nimbin. She'd just come from Melbourne a few years before and she longed for it. And so basically she invited me to Nimbin. I did a workshop. You could invite someone else who's a confident storyteller or someone who can teach that sort of thing. And we did did an initial workshop and from that she springboarded an event and it's apparently still going monthly um, but the other thing is if you don't do that um, you can find all sorts of wonderful resources of many different storytellers telling stories in many different ways and that just starts it's a relaxing way of just taking it in and I've got a playlist on my on my website that you can do that and I can also send um, some resources of things to follow up but yeah there's lots of story circles and there's also a template that I used years ago for a live story circle of how to do that. And basically a wonderful way of doing it is you have a talking stick or a talking stone and you pass it around the circle and whoever's telling has obviously got the stone. And that tends to attract people who are reasonably respectful and have some enjoyment of that kind of a process. So I didn't have any problems there. And then you generally have a theme. The story doesn't have to be in response to the theme, but it has to be in the moment. So this is this is actually a, a key thing. I'm so glad you asked that question. I've forgotten about it. Is that instead of bringing a rehearsed story, like, oh, the theme is trees. Oh, I know the story about a tree. I know the mulberry tree. I can take that story. No. The idea is you have to tell a story that's in the moment, that's responding to the person, one of the people who's told. So the first story could be you know but it tends to, the, the the encouragement is for it to be fresh and in the moment so you might not even reveal the theme and then you just start and then it's more like just a cup up around the kitchen table so like, oh I remember yeah my grandma used to do that and you just tell a little story and it doesn't have to be long but there is a timer there's a time limit so maximum eight ten minutes say I love that yeah, and that's that freshness that we're talking about. Get off the script from going. Oh, I have that story. I have a script about that. I'll bring that along into that freshness. That, that when there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're starting, yeah. that's the pressure. It's like oh, I have to perform. Whereas when you do, when you do like those really quick writing prompts too, where you've got two minutes to write something, your inner critic is just given a rest because who can write something genius in two minutes? Well, you might if you're lucky, but you know. It settles all that down. So the thing of being immediately also teaches you to read, and somebody else was making that point, and probably lots of people have, that a really important part of being a good storyteller is actually listening. And that's what makes you a good storyteller, Morik, is that you're actually listening, although we're not actually literally listening to people, I can't even read all your, all your, all your chats, but if we were in the same room, but you're tuning in from the feedback that people in your community have given you to what they're interested in, and you're um, adjusting to tell them stories that are relevant to what um, what they're interested in. Mm. Yeah, the listening is such a, a, a huge part, isn't it? That response, being in, in a responsive state rather than a, a delivery model. And there's places for all of those things, of course. Yeah. But you know, yeah. yeah but look, there is ways of telling stories like that. That, but it's just a delivery, but it's much better if it's there's relationality and you're present in the moment and you're being a conduit for the story that wants to come through you in that moment with those people on that occasion. Yeah. Well, 
Thank you so much, Jenny. It's been such a delight to be in conversation with you here today. Uh, there's, I, I have notes all over my paper and I look forward to um, <laughs> receiving those resources. And before I send them out to, I'm going to have a deep dive in there because I I feel I have this, this, there's this very tangible sense that I have that the storytelling is an essential part mm. of this transformation that we're in right now mm. to craft, to share, to open up the possibilities for a, for a future that we'd like to see in this world. And as permaculture educators, the storytelling is such a powerful part. So um, everyone who's here, please, you know, I really encourage you to explore these um, you know, I can see Sue there. Um, hi, Sue. You know, I we were having a conversation the other night. This, Sue is my mother-in-law, and Sue knows Meg, who's in your where you're staying right now. Um, they were best, they were best friends, and and um, oh, hi. Hi, Sue. Jenny's actually in Meg's house anyway. So I was chatting with <laughs> that little mural there that Meg left that there. Yeah, I'm in her office. Yeah. So I was chatting with Sue about birthing stories the other day. And it just came up. We didn't plan to talk about it. And then I found myself sharing those stories in another event that I was running. And it, isn't it so amazing how when we just are, we are always in the space of story. Story yep. infuses everything about our everyday life. Yeah. And, and if we can bring those into when we're in our public educator role spaces in that, that humanness, it brings all of us into that space and it connects us deeply with our with our broader community, with our culture, with the questions that we're grappling with, you know, like what are, what am I really struggling with right now and and what are the different stories that I'm hearing and how can I bring them together into a new weave that can help me understand and by sharing that might help you understand and and then when I hear you say something, it's like, oh, that's right, and that then in you know, next time I share that story, it's going to be different. It's never, I find that the stories I share are never quite the same, you know, yeah. any time. So I really do encourage everyone who's here to play with this, you know, really explore the possibilities. So thank you, Jenny, for being here as a catalyst for this conversation and for sharing the wealth of your, your knowledge and experience in, in this and how to craft and, and explore the idea of what is story and how we can integrate it into our world here as permaculture educators. You know, those of you here may not be permaculture educators, but just want to be storytellers too. So I'm, I'm not trying to exclude you from that, but I know there are lots of people in the world of permaculture. So hey, Luby says she's inspired to do more storytelling. Oh, Fantastic. hi, Luby. Love you to see you here. Thanks. And I just need to acknowledge also, you know, to Morag that I got a bit, I was saying to Morag, I, I got a bit down during lockdown, like many of us, being an extrovert and a performer, not being able to contact people much was really challenging. But some of the things that got me through, one of them was listening to Morag's peppy um, videos and, you know, learning about tomatoes and learning about eating pumpkin leaves and all those things that it really <laughs> brightened my day. So it's just been such a joy to be able to actually talk to you about storytelling. Yes, lovely. I'm so glad we've connected on this. And I look forward to um, further collaborations on, on storytelling. And, and one thing I also want to acknowledge, Jenny, um, one of the young women we work with uh, in a refugee settlement in Uganda, um, Roland, uh, had, was talking about how she was really deeply wanting to share her story. She escaped from the Democratic Republic of Congo and landed in Uganda as a young woman and, and a young girl, really, and her life there in the camp and how what that had meant for her and how she cares for so many siblings and she helps to, to tell, you know, stories and connect elders with young people and weaving permaculture. Anyway, she said, I'd love to tell this story. And, and yeah. she said, can you help me find a mentor? And anyway, I just keep asking different questions. Jenny said, I know somebody. And so the other night, there we were on this call. There was Laura um, from, yeah, Laura from, from New, York. New York and Roland from Uganda and Jenny yeah. and I were all here together. And now those two are talking together and she was talking about how she was helping to kind of help pull out the threads of Roland's story and help ask her questions so she could share the story because Roland wasn't quite sure how to quite get it down onto paper. So thank you yeah. for that, you know, and when we share our stories about what we're, what we're working on as well and what we're struggling with, you know, it's a wonderful opportunity to, to connect and, and support one another. So, And be real. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, everyone. Take care and enjoy the rest of your evening, morning, day, wherever you are in the world. And I hope to see you again next time. The recording will come out. So if you'd like to follow and all the links to everything that we've been talking about. Um, yeah, hope to see you again soon. And thank you again, Jenny. It's been an absolute delight to have your company here today.